Namaskara, Namaste and greetings for the day. I'm Sneha Maheshwari and I welcome each and every one of you to the first of its kind flagship episode of C4C Conversations. In this series, we will touch base on a plethora of topics and subjects that have aroused our curiosities for decades. Citizens for Citizens is an organization or a group of citizens who are passionate about improving their surroundings and are collaborating in different ways amongst themselves as well as with the authorities to leave our surroundings a little better than we found it. Rajkumar Dugar, the founding member, is an electronics engineer and has been in the IT hardware field. However, during the last six years, he has been focused on social work. He was co-founder and secretary of Vasant Nagar Residents Welfare Association and was secretary of Association for Information Technology until last year. Now, he is full-time into C4C activities. Started by Mr. Dugar in May of 2019, C4C has focused on various projects and I will request Raj to give a brief overview of C4C. Over to you, Raj. Hello, Namaskara. I can see that apart from uh, C4C members, there are a good number of attendees today who are not C4C members. Uh, many of you are presently <coughs> elsewhere in India too and uh, outside India. But you have a connect with Nama Bengaluru. So let me very quickly mention what C4C is, is all about. C4C is just over a year old, having started in May 2019. Uh, the biggest challenge faced by about 2 crore people residing in and around Bengaluru is traffic congestion. We are working on various fronts, including metro, BMTC buses and railways, uh, in order to ensure reduction in traffic, traffic congestion. Uh, very soon, one of the projects we took up, that is trains to airport, uh, will become a reality. C4C has worked on a unique project to eliminate dark spots by undertaking a streetlight survey in Vasant Nagar. We collaborated with the concerned BBMP officials, um, resulting in elimination of about 80% of the dark spots. C4C is closely working uh, associated with uh, Koti Viksha Sainya, a program to increase afforestation of Bengaluru on a massive scale by the citizens and the government. Right now, planting is being done on railway lands in Bengaluru as well as by citizens in various parts of the city. During the recent uh, COVID times, C4C was in the forefront in implementing social distancing, uh, distributing homemade masks, cotton masks, handing over dry rations to the needy, taking care of young and vulnerable plants and providing much needed support and confidence to COVID positive patients and so on. Today, I'm really happy that C4C is launching a digital program of educating common people on various interesting <coughs> and relevant topics. And the best topic we could find for our launch program is to get to know our city better. We are all passionate about our city and the least we can do is to understand the real history of our city. And who else to start this than Uday Kumar, who has dedicated his life to unearth the early history of Bengaluru using all his and his team's skills. We need to support this effort in any which way we can. Please sit back and understand all that he presents to you. I am sure it will be extremely interesting and enlightening to all of us. C for C Paravagi Nimmelerigu Suswagata. Many of us hold the belief that Bengaluru is relatively new and young city with a history of about 500 years. But today we explore the huge history for our city, which can be said to be thousands of years old. Udaya Kumar is a passionate Bangalorean and an accidental historian conservationist. He is currently working to secure and build more awareness about Bangalore's incredible inscription stones. In the past, he has researched Bangalore and its connections with Great Trigonometric Survey of India. He has a master's degree in engineering mechanics from IIT Madras and has worked with the Tata General Electric and Schneider Electric. Udaya was recognized as <coughs> Nama Bengaluru Citizen Individual of the Year 2019 for his work in the area of heritage conservation in Bengaluru. Today, Udaya will take us through an exciting journey of Bengaluru from, hold your breath, from Antarctica through the centuries right up to 16th century AD. This journey is completely uncharted territory for most of us 
definitely for me and I'm super excited to get to know more about it. I strongly urge you to pay full attention and stay until the very end of this program so that you get to know more about Nama Bengaluru. As interesting as it is, it's also going to be quite enlightening. Please feel free to post your queries in the comment sections below and Udaya will address to a select few at the end of his talk. Over to you Udaya. Thank you Sneha and uh, thank you Raj. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the story of this wonderful city uh, to a C4C audience. Uh, it's a special occasion for me because the kind of work that we do and the C4C organization does are very similar and to be able to communicate the story of Bengaluru to you all uh, is, is an amazing opportunity for me. Um, so. Um, the way I will um, structure this um, presentation is I will talk about uh, for about 65 to 70, 70 minutes. And um, you know, during this time, if you have any questions like Sneha said, please do keep um, you know, sending them in the chat window. Uh, the end of the event around um, you know, after 60, 75 minutes, I will um, take them up one by one and we will uh, you know, clarify those questions for you. A little bit about ourselves, you know, Inscription Stones of Bangalore. Uh, we, are, um, we, are, we are a group of people, you know, concerned citizens, it's teachers, professors, uh, historians, researchers, uh, bus drivers, rickshaw drivers, plumbers, all high, software engineers, all kinds of people who strive to, um, you know, build more uh, awareness about the st story of Bengaluru and, uh, uh, you know, help in the conservation of uh, some incredible heritage that we have. And that's what I'll be showing to you today uh, during the course of this uh, talk as well. Okay. Uh, so to start off with, um, almost everything that I'm going to be showing you today uh, has been discovered by archaeologists, have been discovered by scientists, all other kinds of people as well. Uh, I have not discovered this. Um, all I have done is piece, the, piece together the story from all these discoveries and narrate it in my own way, a synthesis of all kinds of information that's available out there in the public domain is what you're going to be hearing today. Uh, every one of these um, artifacts, whether it's a sculpture or an inscription or pottery item or whatever, um, in the slides, you will also see the sources for this, um, just to give you an idea of who are the people who worked on this and how it was discovered. Um, now, um, just so that we understand clearly what it is when someone says a journey or a story of a place. Um, it's very simply, you know, the. Um, it's a record or it's a narration of everything that has happened at that particular place. From time immemorial or from the time when planet Earth was formed. Generally, uh, the way the story of any place is understood is slightly different. You know, we kind of break it up into chunks and, you know, we call it history, which again, you know, we break it up further. We say political history. Uh, which is really the story of some some kings and you know some battles. Then there's social history. That's um, you know about other people, uh, not just kings and uh, queens. And then there's cultural history, which is about you know what kind of literature, dance, music, everything else, you know, science and technology that formed or that happened or transpired at that place. So, you know, for our convenience, we kind of break it up into different um, buckets. So, we, you know, some people call it as proto-history, pre-history. Uh, then, you know, with all the new fields that are coming about, with the, with the application of modern current technology um, uh, to understanding, unraveling the past, uh, names like archaeogeology, ethnoarchaeology, archaeoastronomy, archaeometallurgy, evolutionary genetics, evolutionary biology, evolutionary linguistics, a lot of, lot of terms are uh, bandied around and people tend to segment and uh, narrate 
a story of a place from that perspective. But to me, really, that's, um, that's one small uh, you know, snippet of the place. All of these collectively together is what is the journey or the story of a place. Okay? So keeping this in mind, uh, so let's try and discover the journey of Bengaluru. And I use the terms Bengaluru and Bangalore uh, you know, without um, any difference. It's just a choice of words. Uh, in English, uh, prefer to use Bangalore. In, in Canada, when, when I'm speaking in Canada, it naturally is Bengaluru. So in this presentation, I'll use both of them. Um, it's, yeah, pick whichever one is convenient for you. They mean the same. And the Bengaluru that I'm talking about is essentially the bounds of the city that we know of as it is today. Everything within the BBMP uh, boundary, which is uh, you know some 800, 900 square kilometers of area, that area is what I'm focusing on. Once in a while, I just step out a little outside of the boundary for a few reasons, and I'll explain why. But that's the story or the, just the journey of the place that I'm covering today. So uh, having understood that, so let's start at the absolute very beginning. And that beginning is the time when the Earth started to form. And that's considered about four and a half, four billion years ago, when it was just on, um, in a hot liquid mass of something. You know, the shape of it is not known. It could have been spherical, like as in this um, picture, or it could have been something else. Uh, but essentially, it was terribly hot, and all of it, whatever it was, was liquid. And over a period of time, this started to condense and, um, you know, form into um, something that are called the fragments of solids. And what you're seeing on this um, screen at this moment is a zillion such fragments um, slowly starting to solidify. And as these solidified, they actually also accumulated into larger and larger pieces. And these pieces, um, you know, uh, many of these pieces formed together and started floating on this liquid mass. So these big pieces that were floating around are called as plates for convenience and nothing else. And um, these, and the inner of the inner part of this earth was still um, liquid, uh, when the surface, um, you know, started to solidify into these plates. These plates essentially turned into rock, or rather the top surfaces of these essentially became rock. And that rock is the oldest material that's out there in Earth, uh, which we can see even today in, in, a, in, a, in a bigger mass uh, form. Okay, And what's extraordinary about that is those rocks are a part of Bangalore today. Most of us would have gone to uh, Lalbagh, and in Lalbagh, uh, there's that um, hillock there, which is very famous. And that rock is the oldest leftover rocks from that time when the earth started to form into a solid mass. And that's about three billion years old. So think about this. There's nothing else out here on earth that you could touch, you can feel, you, know, you can walk over that old. That's a part of Bangalore today. And this photo, uh, the way it's been taken is deliberately to show you the rock and hide some of the other features. The idea was essentially to, it may be unfamiliar to you when you look at this photo as it is, and that was deliberate. This photo was taken about a month uh, back, so the rock's very much there, safe uh, and intact. However, this rock, it goes by a particular name. It's called the Peninsular Nice, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, pronounced as Nice, Nice, you know, whatever. That's about three billion years old. And if you thought Lalbagh's the only place where you find this rock, actually that's wrong. In Bangalore, we are extremely fortunate that we have this rock in lots of other places. So um, the Shavige Maleshwara Hills, uh, which is near Kumar Samilayot, 
uh, where uh, Dhanan Sagar College is. That, that still exists fine. The place where I'm sitting now, right now, and talking to you, <clears throat> that's called Rajajnagar First R Block. And um, that's the place where ISKCON's built. It used to be a hillock, not so evident today. And that hillock was essentially the Nace Rock, three billion years old. The Basangadi Bull Temple, Hanumant Nagar, a lot of areas in and around uh, Bangalore. In fact, the underlying uh, rock in uh, Bangalore is this. So much so that you know we um, we don't realize the kind of exclusive exclusive uh, nature of this. It's very very rare elsewhere in the world. You do not find this rock in North America, Europe, or most other places. Um, this is the second oldest rock in the world. There's some bits and pieces in uh, Australia and in Canada, but over here in an urban setting in Bangalore, you know, we have this in abundance. So much so that we have been querying this uh, for a long time. Most of our homes, most of our roads, most of what we build is actually from this old same rock. Okay, so when, so when you wherever you are sitting today, that's where it's an historic location. It's an historic base that you are sitting right now. And that's where the story starts. However, this rock, wherever you, wherever it is, whether it's in Lalbag or Shavagya Malaysia Hills or wherever else, is not was not where it has always been. And that's the interesting part of it. When those plates started to solidify, they also started to drift. And what's being shown here is, you know, this is this graph here shows that spot, the spot that I'm showing here, these are the GPS coordinates for my house, the place where I'm sitting here in Bangalore. Over the last um, 550 million years, this place where it is, which is today 12.96 north, 77, whatever, east, was not where it was. So this is the latitude and this is the time that you're seeing on the screen, okay? So um, the play, this spot, let's assume on the rock where I am today, our 550 years ago was somewhere near the equator. And then over the last 300 million years, it drifted down to about minus 70 degrees south. That's the Antarctic. So the Bangalore that we know of today was deep, deep south, somewhere in Antarctica, about 300, 300 million years ago, 250 million years ago. And from then, it started to drift up north over a period of time, hundreds of millions of years, and slowly over that time reached the position that we are in today. Okay, so the journey of this place that we now call Bangalore actually has been a quite an extraordinary journey. Started somewhere in the equator, midpoint of the earth, floated down into uh, the southern hemisphere almost to the southern pole, and then drifted up again, crossed the equator, and we are now 13 degrees up north of the Arctic. And this is why I labeled this talk as the journey of Bangalore from Antarctica on. And that's where we started. Okay? Yeah. Now, while we are drifting up like that, there was a few other things that also happened. This place called Bangalore has also has had an extraordinary journey. It's risen up. It's risen up in height, and um, it's risen up to about 930 meters or 900 plus, whatever, 30, 40 meters from, depending on where you are today. It's 930 meters is pretty high up, very high up fr from an urban, um, you know, city kind of uh, environment. So high up that we don't realize what we, you know, what we are, um, benefiting from. So this is an animation, watch carefully. What it does is, it assume if, if the sea level were to rise up, which portions of the country would be flooded is what this um, animation depicts. And the, this is done by Raj Bhagat, uh, who's an expert at this kind of uh, graphics. What he has done is any city 
that's still above water is called that as the new capital of India. So that's his terminology. But however, keep a watch on Bengaluru. And Bengaluru is, you know, here. So I'll play the animation. You'll see the water flooding up, flooding into the uh, country or the landmass. Okay, so as you saw, Bangalore was amongst the last places to be flooded. That's pretty high up. Um, last places as in the last cities that were to be flooded. I'll play the animation again so that you can watch it again carefully. There you go. Right. So now this is um, this has an effect. One, it's also the reason for our pleasant climate. Two, it's also the reason for quite a few rivers to be born here. We have five rivers in the vicinity of Bangalore. In Bangalore, in the vicinity of Bangalore. If you think of Bangalore. Cut, cut it in the north, south, uh, right in the middle. You know, the, you have the eastern and the western sections. You have the Arkavati, Rishabhavati, and Kumudavati, all of that you know, on the eastern side. They all end up in the Kaveri ultimately. On the western side, which is you know the Hoskote, Vartur side, uh, you have the Dakshina Pinakni and the Ponaya rivers originating from here. Why is that? Basically because we are high up you know, in terms of altitude. There's also another very interesting out, you know, outcome of the altitude. All the lakes in the city, they're man-made. Okay? Anytime you look at any lake, there's always a question about um, how old is this lake? Who built this lake? When was it built? You can be absolutely sure every lake in the city of Bangalore, and I'll touch upon this in a little while later, man-made. So all these rivers, or its tributaries or the streams that join up with these rivers, they were all kind of, uh, you know, somebody built a bund over the uh, river or the stream and um, a lake came about. I'll talk about uh, many of these river lakes when they were built as well. Okay, and um, moving on, so this is like kind of millions and you know, billions of years. So let's come a little forward, make, us, make a big jump actually. Uh, there's lots of intermediate steps, but um, you know, for lack of time, I'll skip them. Uh, what evidences do we have of man, man, women, humans, living in this region? Okay. Um, for that, I'll go a little bit outside to show you some incredible uh, things uh, in a place called Managondanahalli. Managondanahalli is um, about as the crow flies. Uh, line of sight about 30 to 35 kilometers from, let's say, uh, center of Bangalore. So it's really not so far out. What you are seeing here are um, incredible things. These are called menhirs. Tall, you know, vertical stones slanted, or you know, kind of um, oriented in uh, different ways. These were built by people. They were built quite some time back. I'll come to the timelines in a second. These are called as cis, burial places. You know, these people were um, very civilized. So any, any one of their kin, kith and kin who were dead, died would be buried in a very proper way, uh, you know, with um, in, in stone enclosures like this. And this is called a stone circle. I will see significance of these as well. So what are these menhirs? What role did they play? It's very visible from uh, this, um, uh, in a beautiful photograph loaned by uh, Dr. Sri Kumar Menon from NIAS. He specializes in these kind of studies. So what you're seeing here are is are two menhirs, and the sun set setting between them. So most of these menhirs, not all of them, also had an astronomical significance. You know, on uh, days of solstices, in um, 
In Kannada, in our languages, we call them as Uttrayana and Dakshinayana, which in many ways is the um, you know, onset of summer or winter. So the sun travels um, in, to one extreme. When you see the sunrise every day, you'll see that it's not at the same spot, but it kind of travels north and south. At one extreme point where it swings back in direction, let's, let's say it was heading north, and then it kind of travels back, that's a solstice. And these menhirs were marks for that. So on solstice day, this is the sunset. The sun is setting exactly between two menhirs. So menhirs served as um, calendars, timekeepers of certain ways, of certain sorts. Why were they important? Lots of reasons, one of which was agriculture. You know, you, you definitely needed to know when the, you know, the summer begins, when the winter begins, if you want to sow the crop, you want to plow the fields, keep them ready for the rains and all of that. And keeping tra track, you know, in terms of days is harder, but if you're looking at the sun, it's pretty easy to do this. So they set up these stones for that purpose, lots of cases. So the example I'm showing here is not from Managondanarli, but it's from another place. Why is it not from Managondanarli and why is it we don't know is um, because we have so casually destroyed these menhirs in you know, Managondanarli. Some, some of you, you know, who traveled abroad are more aware, probably have heard of Stonehenge in England. They are menhirs and they serve the same purpose as well. Uh, so, um, we had one in, um, in, 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 Bang, in, in Bangalore, which you know, we, we did not care about and we destroyed. So this photograph is from the ASI website. This is, um, don't know the date of it, but it's, it's pre-2012 for sure. This photograph is taken in the last week when I went there to check on these. This area now is a rice field. This is dated to be from about 1000 BC, 10th century BC, before Christ, before common era, 3000 years old. Now, they, we do not have heritage older than this. And this is not some idiotic dumb heritage. Okay, this was a calendar, this was a timekeeper, this was the day, this is how they identified uh, you know, solstices those days. Even today, we celebrate uh, you know, Uttarayana, Dakshinayana in our uh, homes. In some, in some regions, it's also the beginning of a new year. If that thing that uh, served that purpose, probably, because it got destroyed before somebody could study it as, you know, at all. We casually destroyed it, and we grow rice now. It was supposed to be a centrally uh, um, protected monument that's been destroyed. It's just not that that we have in Mangondanelli. There's, um, like I showed before, there were tens, at least 30 to 100 burialses, dolmens, stone circles, all of these there. It was a thriving um, hamlet, village, town, or whatever it is that you want to think of 3,000 years ago. Such an extraordinary thing, most of us ordinary Bangaloreans. Never heard about it. We've never seen it. We don't even care. So obviously we don't care for it. We've destroyed it. Not only have we destroyed it, we continue to destroy whatever small is, is stuff is still left there. How did we destroy it? You're seeing on the left here, treasure hunters. There is this belief that, you know, the um, burial cis, the um, this gold there, these treasures underneath that. So treasure hunters destroy those cysts, try to find this, you know, the treasure there. The irony is the treasure is not underneath the cyst of the dolmen itself is the treasure. And we destroyed it when we kind of dug it out and wasted it away. And this is another big issue. It's a like I spoke about rock before in abundance in Bangalore and vicinity, quarrying. So over here, so by the trees here is where the menhirs were. All over here were dolmens and cysts and all of those, uh, you know, homes, burial sites, pottery, all of that, arrowheads, uh, whatever else they used during those days, 
uh, in this area, casually destroyed, completely blasted out. There's not even a, not anything to say that there was this. There are still one or two things left out there, but it takes a fairly educated person to discover them and understand their value for what it is. Now think about this, 3,000 years ago, uh, civilized people lived in Bangalore. And this is one of those sites. This is one of their homes. What can be more valuable heritage than this? I can't think of anything else for a Bangalorean. And that's why, uh, uh, that's what we've done with it. And this is a CF C4C um, and a program. So while I can narrate a story and just you know make it all hunky-dory, I would rather that you know everyone see what we have done with it. What is it that we had? What do we have? How can we protect it as well? Okay, all right. So um, now if you think about this, so what, what language did these people um, talk 3,000 years ago? They must have, must have been a very, very uh, sophisticated people, right? Communication must have been um, very, very efficient and very clear if they had to build those kind of structures. 3,000 years ago, they probably spoke a language which is um, very similar or similar to what um, the Irulas, the Soligas, or the tribals in uh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, some of these places speak um, today. Um, uh, in, today, when we hear those, we probably think those are a uh, mixture of Tamil and Kannada. So, there's bits of Tamil, there's bits of Kannada, all of that, basically because these languages have all evolved from there. And these tribal communities continue to speak this because they have been kind of um, the effect of um, other people, the effect of uh, migration, effect of mingling, you know, traveling elsewhere, all that is quite reduced. So there is, um, while that has happened nevertheless, the effect of that has uh, not been so much on those people. So those languages are probably reminiscent of what uh, was spoken in the region of Bengaluru 3,000 years ago. Okay. Um, coming a little bit closer to home, Jalahalli. Um, Jalahalli is well known, used to be an Air Force base, still is an Air Force base, uh, the region of HMT, H, you know, um, all of that. Uh, this, many of these things that I'm showing you now are essentially recent discoveries. When I say recent, they're in the order of about 50 years, um, maybe even recent, even, le even lesser. So not so much into textbooks yet. Hopefully they will make it someday. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to be telling you is um, hopefully new and uh, lesser known. So this is from Jalali. In the you know in the 40s, uh, the British built a massive hospital there called the Indo-British Hospital. This was in um, a preparation for the World War. They expected a lot of casualties and they were equipping themselves in terms of building hospitals in that region. So when you say hospitals, they look like this. So these are really the wards, if you want to think of it, or cottages or whatever. Um, so one um, Navy, naval British man was hospitalized there for some other sickness, uh, but he also had another profession. He was an archeologist. So while he was admitted in that place, uh, he also, um, when he was looking out the window, so he saw two hillocks uh, kind of uh, uh, around the uh, cottage or the hospital. And uh, being an archeologist, he kind of uh, immediately uh, was very curious because these look like exactly the kind of settlement places for a prehistoric man. Um, and one day he uh, went out, just stepped out of the compound. And to his amazement, he discovered all these tools there, lying in, uh, no, by the hundreds. So these are stone tools, they call them microlithic tools because they're small tools, uh, sharpened stone, so they're basically tied to um, arrowheads, axes, uh, they become cleavers, all of these. Um, and there was, there was iron, obviously, and all that, but iron was scarce. Uh, stone doubled up um, fairly well as a tool for um, cutting and you know, all those kind of things. So there were so many of these that he uh, thought this is not a place where people just live because the raw material there uh, was perfect for this kind of tool making. Uh, there were a bunch of people there who were, ma who were making this and then sending it out to other places. So he calls it as the factory. 
This is, da this is dated to be about from 1000 BC. Okay? 1000 BC, 3000 years ago, and people lived in Jalali, the area of Jalali. And it's not just an ordinary place they were manufacturing these uh, tools, being sent out to other places as well. Okay? Yeah. Um, now, if you go and see that, looking for these sites, he published this as well. I'm sorry. Uh, he published these. Um, this is from a journal article he published in um, in, a, in, an, in a magazine called Anthro um, Monthly Record for Anthropological Sciences. Here you Todd, the man who discovered this. Um, we have photographs of this, and soon as he uh, collected them, he sent it off to the British Museum in London. Apparently, they're still there. So if you get a chance to go to London, you can see this in person. So what did we do with this site? It wasn't explored for, uh, no, extensively later. We have built a massive apartment complex there. Okay. Everything that was still probably there, was, which, was which was available for study, has been destroyed, completely gone. We lost the opportunity to uh, see what it was, to study it further. We lost the opportunity to even see it. <laughs> we don't have anything left there to see. Mm -hmm. um, the other sites as well, uh, that was not the only site. Similar such tools have been found uh, Tipa Sandra, the other site near Chile Airport, uh, Lalbagh as well. So it's not just one of, uh, you know, that Jalali was where we found these kind of uh, relics from those periods. They um, were found in lots of places. So this is another one closer, uh, you know, in the city as well. It's called Kanur. And um, you know, this lady here is called Almutra Patel. Uh, like um, like Rajkumar, she was an activist. Uh, she worked a lot um, to kind of improve the city, make it even better. Uh, she lives in that region, and she knew that these were dolmens. Uh, incidentally, she's an extraordinary lady. She was also the first uh, lady to get a doctorate from MIT. Uh, this is sometime in uh, the 60s. So she was well educated, and she was aware of what this was. So this is actually a dolmen. A dolmen is a kind of a rock shelter. Uh, there's some that were used for living, some that were used for burial, some, you know, we don't know. What they look like is um, what is shown here. So this is her uh, in the 90s. This is an article from 94, the week uh, magazine. Uh, that site, and that was the dolmen that we saw just now. There were five of these. Um, what happened was that um, you know, there was uh, that land that was sold to somebody and they wanted to build there. So they excavated, uh, this is the footing, you know, that's the earth excavated to build a foundation there. When they excavated it, um, she came to know about it. And she rushed over and stopped the work. And what you're seeing here is a urn that would have been inside this. That urn usually holds um, uh, you know, the skeleton remains, uh, other um, things that have been put along with the body, sometimes food items, grain, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. So this, could, uh, this is uh, what um, were shown as what uh, food they lived on, how old the site is. We could carbon date this and we could use it. Uh, we could have done all of that, but all we did was we casually kind of dug the earth out, broke it into pieces and all of that. But the lady that she was, uh, she stopped the work and all this mud that you're seeing here, she had it sieved. It took about three weeks to sieve the entire earth because it was all excavated you know, in, by JCB and quickly. Uh, nevertheless, she saved it very carefully, meticulously, and they retrieved these pieces. This has been donated to um, the Oriental Research Institute in Mysore and Mythic Society and a few other organizations. The basis of this is what we know it to be from 1000 to 500 BC. Okay? The structure that was buried was actually this one. So what they did was, in order to protect this and you know, to ensure that proper excavation was possible later, she had the whole thing covered up with earth. Well, that's the Kanur dolmen. And just so other, you know, we can show you other places in the city as well. This is from Dort Canelli. Uh, around the same time period, rock art on a boulder, people of those days had carved sketches of some things of those days. So here you can see a cow, and the man's pulling the cow, dragging the cow, probably going back home. This is a rural scene even now today in our villages. Okay, and this is a man riding a horse. So there were uh, possibility of horses those days, and he's riding back. And this one's a, 
you know, partying scene. You can see the people are, you know, dancing around probably a bonfire. And these are some, of, this is from Dotkaneli on Sajapur Road. This is from Gatigere, which is, uh, you know, at the nice uh, toll, uh, toll gate around there. There's a place called Gatigere on the hillock. These are similar arts, uh, line drawings of what was there on the rock. Incredible heritage, again, 1000 BC. What have we done with it? Just like we did with Maragondan Ali. This boulder was blasted with dynamite about 10 years back to build something over there. What we have is a massive pit there now, and the localites use, use that as a garbage dump. This is the Gatigere hillock. You can, as you're going on nice road, you can actually see this. The rock over here had, those, had this rock painting blasted out of sight. Okay, uh, moving forward, and I'm coming more towards um, 0 BCE, common era times. Uh, Bangalore now is uh, famous the world over as an international destination. Name the continent from everywhere. People have come here, they, you know, they run companies here, thousands of foreigners live in Bangalore today. This is not so uh, just now. Mm -hmm. In uh, these coins, <clears throat> these are Roman coins. They have been discovered when they are building the <clears throat> Eshanpur railway station. So when the railway station was being built in 1891, and railway line on railway station are being built in 1891, the Hindupur railway line, and they were digging, digging earth for that, they, they discovered a pot of these, 163 Roman coins. Another incident in HL airport, when they were building the, um, you know, they're doing work on the runway there, they discovered uh, another pot, which is a Roman pot with 256 Roman coins. There's been other uh, finds of Roman coins here. Large number of Roman coins essentially meant that either the Romans visited here or people from here had gone to Rome and bought those coins back or whatever. Essentially, there were trade relationships between people here and Rome 2,000 years ago. It was international, intercontinental um, traffic that long back. And it's not just like ordinary traffic. These are people who are you know, very civilized. They traded, they had raw coins and all of that, and they've been dated to be between 60 BC and 30 CE. Uh, these coins have been lost, unfortunately, again. Uh, we don't have these coins, but they've been documented, so we all know how they looked, how many they were, which denominations, and all of that. Okay. Um, still in the uh, same eras, uh, pottery. Pottery items have been discovered in all kinds of places. This is one example of pottery, which is, uh, which is photographable. I could see this is in the museum today, Tarbanali. Um, similar items have been found in Alsur. Um, you know, the Alsur um, items are now in the Madras Museum. If you go there, you can see it. Agaram, the old race course area, which is, um, you know, the area opposite Command Hospital on Old Airport Road in Lalbagh. Um, anywhere and everywhere. Choknali, uh, you know, the Hagadur, Whitefield area. Pottery items have been dis discovered all over the place, typically from this period, 2000 years old. Okay, um, what have we done with it? None of it exists today. Ash mounds. Ash mounds are essentially pits or uh, mounds where um, you know bones, pottery, etc. All of those have been thrown in for hundreds of years, and uh, they are what help us identify how people lived of those those days. Um, ash mounds are also great fertilizer, <laughs> so farmers love to uh, take it and apply it as fertilizer in the fields. That's what's been destroyed. But you can still go around. GKVK campus, um, you know, farmers around there will tell you we got a lot of ash, ash mounds here. In the Whitefield area, Hope Farm and, you know, close by. There were, there were ash pits there. Uh, we destroyed it. We don't even know what it was. Okay. Uh, the, until this point in time, we don't have any evidence to show that the people were able to read or write. But um, the earliest evidence we get is from around 200 um, AD. 20 years after the common era began, 1800 years from today. A place called Rajgatta. Again, you know, I'd go a little farther out uh, because urbanization has spoiled a lot of these finds within the city. So we'll have to go by what was around. Rajgatta is about, uh, again, you know, 25, 30 kilometers from where I am today. A little past Esargatta, between Esargatta, sandwich between Esargatta and Durbalapur. Similar like uh, what you showed there, we have cyst burial sites. What was extraordinary was not this. These are Buddhist viharas and chaityas. 
Yeah, uh, they didn't find a stupa. We are as a prayer hall, Chaitya, we are a Chaitya as a prayer halls and residences. So there's a Buddhist, there's a Buddhist center and uh, people live there and they practice Buddhism there. How do we know that uh, is because we also have these, what are called as Otis Tupas. Uh, you know, this is a small clay tab, bell kind of a thing. And inside that is this tablet. And on the tablet is engraved something in writing. So this is Brahmi script and Pali language. Both are not local. Uh, Pali is not locally spoken, but it's a Buddhist uh, scriptures, a lot of it in that language. So what is written here is what's um, given in text form here. Uh, these are like, um, you know, in um, people tie a thread around their arms, um, you know, or armbands and things like that. Um, so typically a Buddhist after uh, prayer, so these are, um, you know, these, they use, they use these are, I'm not so sure what exactly they do, but that these are discarded after prayers. There's hundreds of them that have been discovered over there. And this practice of um, a harke or a otio stupa still continues to this day in um, amongst Buddhists in many places. And this is a Buddhist prayer, okay, in, uh, in like I said, in Brahmi script and uh, Pali language. So the, what in, the, the translation of that is what's given here. It says, of all objects which proceeds from a cause, or the chain of causation, the Tathagata has explained the cause and he has explained their cessation also. It's a philosophical statement, whatever. Also given you where, uh, you know, who dated this and what's the translation coming from here. First sign of literate people living in the region of Bain. Okay. So um, from here on, this is more um, very well documented, very datable, uh, you know, past that we come to. So uh, this kind of a narration is possible for every, every place in the city. And I'll take one example to make the point and illustrate it here. Um, so, um, you know, the um, example I've chosen here is Domlur. For different talks, I picked different uh, areas, um, you know, focused on Madiwala, on Begur, on Dodgubi, in different places, in different other conversations. But this time around, I want to talk about Domlur. And Domlur is in the heart of the city, end of MG Road, you know, and uh, that place is an incredible past. When I say past, I'm all referring to here is the pre 16th century. Past that is very little known, and it's extraordinary. So what you're seeing here, this is this is uh, the Domlur Chokkanatha Swami Temple. It's about um, 50 to maybe 100 meters from uh, Old Airport uh, Road. So when you're going on Old Airport Road, when you go past Command Hospital, then you get some uh, defense quarters. Right after the defense quarters, take a left, and you'll end up straight at the temple there. One of Bangalore's best kept secrets. It's, um, this temple is about 800 years old. Not known. Not a favorite destination. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. Either ways, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, temple because it's 800 years old. And how do we know um, it's 800 years old? Is because on the stone here is writing all over this temple. This writing is what are called as inscriptions. They're writing in the language of that time, in the script of that time, Tamil or Telugu or Kannada or whatever. This, te this temple has, um, on the temple and are related to the temple elsewhere, are about 18 inscriptions, starting from about 1180 to about 1500 AD. So during this time, various things have been written, um, give, gifted to the temple and all that, and I'll show you a few examples later. That's what's the documentation for us uh, to show that, to tell that this temple is that old, okay? Um, this is another interesting thing. About, about 100 meters east of the temple are three of these sculptures. It's actually hidden inside a compound wall, not facing the road, but perpendicular to the road. Uh, unless you're walking, you're very likely to miss this. And uh, someone's been very careful and very nice. They're not destroyed this or reoriented these stones. Uh, these, the orientation of these stones is facing the temple. 
So the, main, the face that the deity in the temple, the deity faces east and these faces west. These, these, these people are facing west. If you, can, if you see carefully here, uh, these uh, people are holding something at the neck. That something is actually a knife. All three of them. This is actually a depiction or symbolic depiction of something called an Atma Balidana. An Atma Balidana is a self sacrifice for religious reasons. Uh, traditionally, uh, you know, it's very common for us uh, in our culture to pray to the God and say, you know, God, give me this, uh, solve this problem for me, and you know, I'll I'll do this for you. Uh, the modern version is pretty, say, uh, you know, soft. We say we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll 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 give 108 coconuts, break 108 coconuts, or special, uh, you know, prasada or something of that sort, or some, you know, um, floral decoration or something. Uh, but sacrifice is a part and parcel of our culture. It's an animal sacrifice happens even today. Human sacrifice was not so uncommon. Was uncommon, but um, it was also happening in the past. So typically it would be reasons of um, like say famine or like today you know, there may have been a plague there or some disease which was wiping out people by the hundreds. Uh, so um, you know they would um, pray to the God and say you know help us bring rains or you know whatever is the pestilence save us from this and you know we'll uh, sacrifice ourselves. So this is a record of that. Okay, Please remember this is a voluntary act and it's an extraordinarily courageous act. It takes enormous uh, strength and will to be able to do this. And that's why they're celebrated in that place as heroes. So these are the heroes of, Beng of Domlur. They call us Viragalus. Veera as in hero, Kalu as in a hero stone for them. They're celebrated and they're cherished. Just like we put up statues today for anyone who's done significant uh, enough for us, uh, it could be anybody. So the, this is done. This is about 600 years ago. Okay. So these are inscriptions, and I'll talk about this in a little detail later. This one's from close by. It's a place called Srinivagilu. This again is a hero, and there's writing here, not visible, uh, but you know when you get close, you can see. It. There's two interesting things. There's a mention of the name Dombalura on the stone, which is from 1440 AD, which means we know Dombalur existed in 1440 AD. This one is Srinivagilu, Vagilu, Srinivagilu or ST tank bed. This is area adjacent to EGL. It's a place called ST tank bed. So the name of that was called Sianil Vagilu. Sianil is C Sihi, Nil is Paddy. Wagilu's gate or a village. So the place where they grew sweet paddy, and that's what CNL Wagilu. Okay? So uh, if you think about this now, if I can put the story together, this temple was built around 1100 AD, and it has the, one of the inscriptions gives the name as Domlur in that. So we know Domlur existed in 1100 AD. A lot of these inscriptions here uh, have referred to people living there. So there's mention of carpenters waters, goldsmiths, weavers, trading activities. They were dealing and uh, dealing with cows, horses, sheep. Uh, you know, there, were, there were looms there. They were making cloth there. All of these. There's reference to a lake. Old timers in Domlur will know until as recently as the 70s, the region where um, you know the defense quarters uh, and uh, Bangalore International Center is was a lake. That was a Domlur lake. That lake is referred to in an inscription from 12, uh, in a 1266. How old is Dumlur Lake? 1266 at least. This is how we know the story of lakes. Bindamangla, which is now morphed into Indranagar, is mentioned in a 1266 uh, inscription. Next, Bindamangla is now buried inside Indranagar, the area around Spastic Society, the school there. That's Bindamangla. <laughs> you know, that's as old as 1266 AD. Kodihalli campus, the NL campus of um, Kodihalli, I'm sorry. Um, Srinivagilu, like I said, is 750 AD. How old is Alsur? A lot of people think Alsur is very old. It's not really old by Bangalore standards. It figures first in a 1328 inscription. Domlur itself is older. 
Srinivaglu is twice as old. The mentions of all these places in those inscriptions is what we know, how old these are and from when they have been there. Okay. Um, in these uh, inscriptions, we also have reference to um, sugarcane fields. They grew sugarcane in Domlur. Can you believe that? In rice fields. It's a lot about the place. You can piece all this together, and you know, if you can, you know, for paucity of time, I'm not doing it here, but it's easily a two hour talk just on Domlur explaining, you know, the car, what kind of people live there, who are the people there, what the names were like, what languages they spoke, you know, all of that. Uh, so we'll just take a quick look at one inscription, and that's pretty interesting. Uh, it's also a kind of work that we like to show off. Uh, what are inscriptions? The, the easiest way to think about it is these are gazetted notifications because they are orders of the kings. Like the government's orders today have to be notified in a gazette. That's when it becomes a legal order, right? Inscriptions are those. Okay, and I'll show you one in detail, which is in the Hebalda uh, inscription here. Um, pick, I picked this photograph in particular because um, this has some of the C4C team there. You can see Sonal Kulkarni here. Uh, this photograph is from December 2017 when he had gone to see something there on the ground. At something on the ground were four stones like this. Uh, these are two inscriptions. This writing on these stones not visible at this angle. And this is Virgalu, it's a memorial stone. So we had gone there to see uh, these and consider this for a heritage monument that was being uh, thought of at that point. Okay, it was lying in a ditch, unknown, unrecognized. Six months from then, this is December 27th, 17 was the elections in state for Karnataka state. Remember that? June. <clears throat> so what happens during election time? The government or the elected officials get very busy uh, doing a flimsy job of filling up uh, bottles, unnecessary places, <laughs> and all that. So they went about doing that same here. So that ditch, uh, they were trying to um, you know, um, fill it with stone jelly and concrete it. This was already a concrete road. It's a small inner road. It's not a traffic, uh, this one road. Neither was this ditch of any uh, problem for anyone. They could have just put some you know, barricade to protect people from falling into it, and that would have done. But what they did was they filled it with jelly, and they're going to white top the whole thing and bury the stones completely. So when this uh, was, ex these boys, uh, one of the local people there, by name uh, Dilip Shatriya, a boy there, he reached out to um, a heritage group in J.P. Nagar, a group called as Revival Heritage Hub. So they rushed over there and they extracted the stones from there. And when they extracted it, what they found was this. This is the stone that was extracted. This was the area under the ground. They found writing here. And that writing is from 750 AD. It's in Kannada language. 750 AD makes it the oldest writing in its original form in the city of Bangalore, proper in the city of Bangalore, not like Rajgatta, which is within BDA limits, but not really BBM limits or something. And incredibly, it had the name Perbolal in that, which is actually the name of Hebal of those days. What you're showing here, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what you're seeing here, sorry. okay. So uh, what you're seeing here on the right side is essentially um, a digital image. So one of the things we do as a team also is to digitally scan these kind of inscriptions and get high accurate, highly accurate digital models as a digital way of conservation. And you're seeing that here. Um, so that um, image, a close-up of that, you can see the writing here. It's kind of emphasized to make it more visible. And this is in Canada the modern uh, transliteration of that, and in English as well. This is Kannada of 750 AD. The script as well as the language. This is, an, um, this is the oldest form of Kannada writing that you can experience firsthand in the city. You can go there, you can see the rock, you can touch it, you can trace the characters, and you can see how Kannada was written uh, 1,300 years ago. It's probably the only place or just a handful of places anywhere in the world where you can do this unrestricted. We have lots of places where we can do this. So just for um, you know, 
just to give you a sound of it, I'll try to read this quickly. It's not so hard to read. And uh, where it's coming from? It says, Swasti Sri Siri Purusha Maharaja Prutvi Rajam Gaye Perbolal Nadu Muvatu Man Pel Nagatara Arsarale Arakamorura Maidunam Kodandaleya Rakitayana Rattavadi Kuchi Tandode Uralivi Nol Indra Daka Pukan Pergundiu Kirgundiu Tamma Kul Niriududu I Kalum. Basically, it says, um, you know, during the time of Sri Purusha King, he was a Ganga king of that time in 750 AD. A man named Kittaya is given here, and that's Kittaya here if you see it. Um, he was killed. He was a martyr defending an attack uh, by Rashtrakutas on his uh, town, which is Perbolal Nadu. Um, and uh, for this act, valorous act, which took him to Indraloka, okay, um, so he was commemorated with this hero stone. The people who put it up were his two brothers. That's what it says here. But per bolal nadu is the critical word here. Per bolal, pa is morphed to ha over a period of time. Per bolal, pe bol, hebbard. is a kind of uh, shortcut or quick, uh, this one of how hebbard has been arrived at. So it shows that hebbard has been around from 750 AD. Not only that, it's actually per bolal nadu mootu, which means it's kind of a headquarters for 30 places around hebbard. Okay, such an extraordinary find which was lying in a ditch. <laughs> we thought we'll do something better. It should not be put, uh, usually when we discover something like this, we put it up on a pedestal and keep it safe. That's about all. But we said this is unlikely to be found uh, again anywhere uh, in the city of Bangalore. In fact, in the entire old Mysore region, which is Chitradurga down to wherever uh, south, Pala Nasipur or even Fakabini or wherever, there's only 60 such uh, stones that are there. Of the 60, my guess is about 30 have been destroyed already. So this one's so unique, we said we shouldn't do a ordinary job of where we put it up. So we'll put it up in an extraordinarily uh, beautiful mantapa, a Ganga style mantapa. You know, a mantapa which is um, befitting that stone in terms of its worth, because it's a fine, first sign of literacy. Kita is the first name man we know who's lived in this place you know there's a mention of the oldest of the name hebbal there so it's one of the oldest localities lots of other reasons so we said this is so unique we'll put it up on a pedestal and more importantly we'll not just uh, you know pitch from our in our pockets or anything like that we'll crowdsource it from bangaloreans the world over the world over about 350 Bangaloreans and about six corporates funded this and this um, mantpa is now complete. It's extraordinarily beautiful. It was developed, it was designed by Shishwani Sharma, an architect, specializes in temple architecture. So she uh, went around Ganga structures, temples um, of that time. There are not too many of them left because 1300 years ago is quite a long time. We don't have structures from then. Nevertheless, uh, she studied the few that are there and designed this. Uh, as per the styles and the traditions of those days. So this is a structure, a Ganga style structure has come up after 1300 years. This is the, this is the Kittaya Virgalu, we call that the Kittaya, Hebal Kittaya Mantapa as well. Okay. So while I've been talking to you about destruction of heritage in other instances, uh, we have also been able to save heritage in lots of instances and this I would say is one of the best showcases for that. Yeah, uh, that's about a locality, but how old is the city Bengaluru or the name Bengaluru itself? Okay. <clears throat> um, Bengaluru as a name is quite old. The first mention of Bengaluru is in an inscription stone from about 890 AD. This is in uh, colored in pink is Bengalura in Kannada. It's an inscription and this is the Hale uh, Kannada version. This is the modern Kannada version. This is the English version. All it says is, you know, Srimad Nagatarna Mane Vagati, Perunna Shetti, Bengalur Kalagadol, Nagatarna Magan, Buttanapati Satan. It says Nagatara's son and his adopted son, uh, you know, Perunna Shetti and Buttanapati died in the Bangalore battle. That's what it's saying. It's discovered in 1915 by uh, the then head of archaeological department of Mysore <laughs> in 1915. And he published it 
in what is the most uh, holy of holy journals, the Mysore Archaeological Report in 1915. When he published it, he said something which was extraordinary. He says, this inscription is of considerable interest as it testifies incidentally to the antiquity of Bengaluru, the modern Bangalore, must have existed under this name in about 880. We may now discover, discard the story of Veera Ballala, having gone to the hut of an old woman and eat Bengalu offered by her. The, uh, the ultra notorious, super famous story of Benda Kaluru is make believe. He said, let's, let's, let's uh, discard the story. Nevertheless, and this is the greatest man archaeologist of the time. Nevertheless, we continue to say it today, most Bengalurians I have no hesitancy in saying, Bindakaluru is how the name came about, sir. Utter rubbish. Please remember another you know, extraordinary point here. The point that Bangalore was around in 890, 1100 years ago. Okay, That's not the only instance. By the way, this uh, inscription is in the Begur Nageshwara temple, beautiful temple. It's a must-see. This temple is of the same vintage, 1100 years old. Did you know we have 1,100-year-old, beautiful, intact temple, living temple, prayers go on every day there in the heart of Bangalore. Where is this? A couple of kilometers from Silk Board. Begur may not be known. Silk Board is very well known. It's pretty close to Silk Board. Those stones were lying abandoned on that, in that temple there, uncared for in a pile of rubbish. You know, Intact Bangalore worked on that project for three, four years to get government sanctions, temple management approvals, all of that, and they've now put it up in a gazebo a ped and pedestal, so they display card there. So the, this, this is the Bengaluru inscription stone from 980. It's got some pride of place now. Okay. That's not the only mention as well. In uh, close by in Madiwala, in the Madiwala Someshwara temples, another inscription. This one, 1247, 1248. Actually, it's from March 12th, 1248, where Vengalur, if you can read Tamil, there's a little bit of Grantha here in Tamil. Vengalur is written on one of those inscriptions there. It says, Pematyar of Vepur, Begur has multiple names, but the Ba becomes Va in Tamil. So that's why Bengalur became Vengalur and Begur became Vepur. So Pematyar of Vepur granted some lines, I'm sorry, there's a spelling here, mistake here, uh, below the big tank of Vengalur. There's a big tank in Bangalore, <laughs> and below that, some land was gifted to this temple. The second instance from 1248 AD. Okay, um, that's not all. There's lots more evidences of Bengaluru before the 16th century, giving you some, uh, showing them all here. There's something called the Gumlapura copper plates from 1434 AD. This is in Kannada language. So remember, the first 890 was in Kannada, second was uh, 1248 from Tamil, third one is again Kannada from 1434. There's a gift of lands, uh, there's a gift of lands, uh, you know, where Bengaluru also figures. And a little later, 1450 AD, there's a book, there's a, there's a literature, there's an evidence, uh, Kannada literature called Shiva Tattva Chintamani by Lankana Dandesha. Lankana Dandesha was a wonderful um, army chief ten or a general uh, he was, um, uh, you know, he was he was a general of uh, the Vijayanagar king, Devaraya II. He was very very accomplished man. He actually goes and conquers Ceylon as well. <laughs> you know, uh, the Vijayanagar Empire actually uh, kind of also stretched to Ceylon at one time. Little uh, not so well known. He, he's written a book which is actually a religious book, not about conquests and all that. It's about the Virishava faiths. In that, he mentions some of the famous devotees of the Veera Shaiva uh, sect. In that he calls out by name a person by Bengaluru. So he says Bengaluru somebody. It could have been Bengaluru Raj, for example, just as an illustration. And the last one is from a, is from a Telugu literature again. It's called Varaha Puranam by two people. Again, this is a general. This general is, uh, this is actually a, a, a record of his conquest. So he goes around uh, conquering a lot of places. So in that he calls out and says, I also won Bengaluru. This is in 1480. All these are evidences 
of a place called Bengaluru. It actually is evolving. You know, if you read this, grows from an unknown, unidentified place to a place with a fort worth conquering. <laughs> okay. And it's interestingly, you'll also see that this, uh, the mentions are all in three different languages. First was in Kannada, then it was in Tamil, then it was in Telugu, way long back, 600, 800 years ago. This is also one of the reasons why uh, today Bangalore is a multilingual city. The languages, these three languages have been popular and natively spoken here for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay. Moving on, you know, that's the story of Bangalore. How about localities? So I already showed you this example. This is a stone from the Donglo Chokno Swami Temple, 1440. You can actually read this. It's Do Dombalura. So in a different times, it's been used um, slightly differently. Dombalur, Tombalur, Dombalur. All of these have been you know, in use. The first reference is, Tom, is um, Tombalur in Tamil. The third da, da, you know, thing in Tamil. This is how we know it's been around. Uh, this example I'm showing you is readable. I will pick this because it's more readable. It's from 1440. The first reference to Domlur is 1100, 900 years old. Second example is also something I've shown you. This is Hebal, 750 AD. This place is that old, and there's a story behind. After that, from then on, in the nature of inscriptions and sculptures and all that, the example uh, that I did for Domlur, we can do for all of these places. And they have long stories to tell. This is from Jakur, and this is Professor Nasiman who uh, helps us a lot. So he's reading an inscription here. There's a 10th century inscription, and you can see Jakuri in this. It means Jakur is at least that old. So if we kind of collate all this together and draw a, a word cloud, uh, this is the names that figure in all inscriptions and the date of those inscriptions. The oldest is Begur. 51780. The silk board area has been around for 1500 years and has been using the same name. Slight variations, you know, at times and languages. Begur, Veppur, Bempur, all derivations of the same. Any place you can think about, HSR layout as within it, Elakunte. Electronic city as Togur, Sajapur Road as Dwatkaneli, ITPL, you know, the focal point for a lot of um, our working population. Patandur has been around from 1043 AD. Hebbard. So this is larger the font, the older the place. Smaller the font, younger the place. And the younger, youngest one is pre-16th century that I'm showing you here. So many localities of Bangalore have such an incredible documented past. Okay? Same thing depicted on a map. I'm sorry. The same thing depicted on a map. Uh, these are the wards of the city. Uh, these are the old maps, uh, old ward maps, and a delimitation of site difference, color coded by the vintage. And a brown at the uh, the left extreme here on the legend, it's 500. That's Bempur, 1600 on your right. <laughs> so the uh, you know the inner parts of the city are the youngest, what we consider as the in common parlance we called as the Old, uh, the old city, which is, you know, the Majestic, the Peite, the KR market, really are the youngest. Around them, so many of them, which are not just a few hundred, whatever, many hundred years old. So Silk Board is a uh, thousand years before that. Okay, this map is actually, a, it's a static image. You can access this online. Uh, these are also all the, um, the, the icons there, the green, red, and uh, uh, all that. They are actually locations of inscription stones uh, you can um, you can visit them you can use them it's pretty simple you can i don't have to take a photograph or anything of this do a google search and you can end up with this map okay so the, if that's the lo lo story of some of the localities i'll give you a story of the lakes a sample of that inscriptions again are the place we go to for um, you know these are inscriptions in that will be a mention of a lake, like I said, Domlur Lake. This Kalkere Lake, I've just picked out at random. The beauty of this lake is there's a lake and there's also a channel. <laughs> you know, the channel is where the water drains out from into the fields or you know, neighboring uh, regions for villages for irrigation. So the Kalkere Lake is as old as 1314. 
the channel is also that old. Incidentally, the name of the channel is Narsimha channel. It's mentioned in this inscription. Mm -hmm. So we know this lake's that old. Okay, um, drawing up a list of lakes like before, like localities. These are all the lakes of Bangalore. The oldest, 880 about, about lakes that old, because we find a mention of it in an inscription. And remember a point I made about the topography of Bangalore and the rivers. All lakes in the city are man-made. It's just that we may be ignorant who made it, when it was made. But for a lot of them, we have records of these. <laughs> okay. So Agara Lakes, 870 AD, a blue lake, uh, which is, I think, rejuvenated and uh, coming back to life now, it's 870 AD. Um, any lake you can think of, Begur, Vibhutipura, Kalkere, I already spoke about, Hongsandra, Nakshatelli, Esargatta, all of them, all pre-16th century lakes. There's about 28 or 29 in this list. Very often in the news, we hear about two, three lakes. All the historians of the city talk about two, Dharmambudi, Sampangi. They don't even figure in this list because Dharmambudi and uh, uh, Sampangi are infants, very new ones. We lost two. Nevertheless, we have 28. In this, there's just one, one or two missing, which are 1,000 years or old. Why? And we ought to be celebrating this and we ought to be kind of thumping our chest and saying, look, do you know how old these lakes are? And importantly, from a conservation perspective, you know, we destroyed them. We are letting sewage into that. That's a different story. Quickly, again, rushing through, and I think uh, we are getting ahead here. Yeah, um, religions of Bangalore. So um, again, inscriptions are the route to get, tell this. Shaivite, Shaivism has been around. We have evidence of that in temple in uh, Belur. Belur is actually wind tunnel road. You know, end of wind tunnel road, the other side of HL airport. Uh, there's a Shiva temple there, which is from 1350 AD. Vaishnavism has been thriving. Examples of Vaishnavism from the 10th century, at least in the region of Bangalore. We have Jains. The, uh, the uh, Begur area, we have a lot of Jain uh, you know, artifacts. Earliest one is from 980. I spoke about Rajgata and Buddhism. So we have Shaivites, Vaishnavites, Buddhists, and Jains, all living in this area, thousands of years, in harmony. Sometimes in the ceremony, either ways, they've been here. The languages of the city, hot topic of the day. Since we uh, organized our country on the, uh, on the base of uh, languages, <laughs> we tend to think, uh, you know, Karnataka is all Kannada, Tamil Nadu is all Tamil, Andhra, Telangana is just all Telugu. Not true, Bangalore at least. Evidences of the use of all three languages, 13th century, 1300, we actually from 10th century on. I'm just picking three examples. This is in Vibhutipura, an inscription stone in Tamil, Marat, uh, Marthali in Telugu, Badrali, which is on Magdi Road from uh, Kannada. Best understood if you see this animation. It's a beautiful animation. It shows uh, inscriptions by language in various periods. I'm playing it, you'll see the dot coming up there, depending on the uh, period. Um, So slowly you'll see some dots emerging in three different languages, in actually in Kannada and Tamil. So you'll see as soon as the 10th century is it, Tamil starts to emerge. And then kind of Tamil, Kannada and other languages, are not so many inscriptions in Telugu, but there are quite a few, there are few as well. Keep tabs on the bar as it's going up. Right now we are at 1400. So you'll see, three languages have been in simultaneous use for a long period here. And this is why the city is multi multilingual in nature. It's not migrations that have happened in recent times. <laughs> the migrations have been happening for thousands of years. And um, something's been around for a thousand years, it's native. <laughs> it's not imported is, is the way it is. Yeah, the temples of Bangalore, pre-16th century. So we have Begur Nageshwara, which I already spoke about, 9th century. The Belur Temple I spoke about, this wind tunnel road from 13th century. The Madiwala Someshwara, which is 1248, around, when I say 1248, it's because it's the inscription. Could have been around longer. The Vibhutipura Virashaiva Mata, which is again from 1307. The Kacharkanhalli, 
this is Lingrajpuram area, 1237. This has been rebuilt, but it's been rebuilt with old material. Some of it is uh, reused. The Domlur Chakranath Swami already spoke about at, la, at, la, at length. The Vardaraja Swami temple in Singapura, this is near Vidyarandapura. Okay. So these are all the temples. What about animals? What information do we have about animals from them? This is a, <laughs> a 10th century Virgalu, which unfortunately uh, we didn't recognize for what it to be, and it's been painted over. It would have looked like this in its original form. Some artist um, <laughs> you know, uh, enjoyed and has painted this over. This is a 10th century uh, Virgalu. You see deer. This is from Saraki, JP Nagar second phase. Deer were roaming around there and they were hunting deer at that time. This is from Tada Institute, a Huli Bete Virgalu, tiger hunting or death of a person uh, in a tiger encounter, either ways. And this is a memorial from that. This is also a tiger, all three are tiger um, and a Huli Bete Virgalus. This is a BTM, where the BTM bus stand right opposite. It. You can see the outlines of a tiger here. It's kind of pretty dirty, you can't see this very well. There's a man here. He has a spear, and this is speared the uh, tiger. Same as here. This is Dot Gobi. Tigers, deer, all of these roamed around in this region. And we have evidences of that. And these are the heroes who kind of died in those encounters. Okay. Lots of other heroes. Typically, when we think of heroes, um, you know, we don't seem to know. There were heroes other than kings. <laughs> you know, the only things we, th we tend to think of are the generals as the kings, are the heroes. But there were ordinary people who died for this region, defending their village, defending against women. Um, you know, there were uh, women capturing, you know, uh, kidnapping was very pretty common. So fighting and dying in that was a heroic act. Same with cattle. Wealth was cattle. So there, it used to be that they had thousands of cattle and people would come and, you know, um, steal them. So fighting though with those robbers or whoever, uh, this one is such a one from Dasrali, Tumkur or Dasrali. This is from uh, Kaikondran Hali, 750 AD. So he is actually, uh, sorry, yeah, this is Kaikondran Hali. This is a hero who was defended and died in an attack on Kaneli, Dot Kaneli. So this is Allala Sandra. Uh, so uh, um, yeah, this is right now in the museum. This one's actually, if you can see it, 8th century Kannada, half buried at road level open to the road, dogs urinate on this. This is the dignity we have been uh, kind enough to bestow on our heroes of Asterias. More instances, this is the other one I said, the Jinke Bete, the Jinke Virigalu, <laughs> Jinke Bete one, stuck it on a compound wall, he painted it. This one's actually in a house. <laughs> it's again a form of, a, it's a 10th century one in Saraki. It's a king and a queen sitting on a divan, and, the, and these are dancers there. So uh, something has happened, probably a political battle or something. He's died. This is a depiction of heaven. This is what I said was Sri Vaishnavism. This is Vishnu. You see the Shankar and the Sudarshan Chakra here. And these people are supposed to be in heaven, and depiction of heaven is Vishnu here, and they are there. Another Atma Balidana, uh, one like I showed in Domlur, this time from Dodgubi. Sati Virgalus, this was near, found near uh, the planetarium between planetarium and uh, Rajbhan, incredibly in a gutter. <laughs> 10 years ago, it's been shifted to the museum. Heart of the city, this is about 14th century. Uh, again, these are all encounters, um, different types. Most of them are political in nature. Some are not political. So when the man has died, his wife has chosen also to die along, go along with him. And that's, she's raised her hand. That's an indication of sati. This was found last week two days back, in fact, in Begur, 10th century. We're still discovering these. Okay. Um, okay um, instance of science and so on and so forth. I think in a paucity of time, I'll move on. Um, Again, there were administrative units, various Nadus that uh, Bangalore or the region of Bangalore was a part of. Taxation, it's an evidence of um, what kind of trades were there here. Now, obviously, agriculture was a big thing. So there was wetland, there was wetland and there was dry land. People had orchards. Um, 
there was all kinds of taxes that were levied here, which shows the nature of occupations here. Okay. Uh, what I have not covered again, lots of other things. Schools of Bangalore, Agraharas, any Agrahara you can think of, including Parapan Agrahara or Konena Agrahara or all the other Agraharas around in Bangalore, they were essentially settlements for uh, largely for Brahmins. They were also with the um, Patshalas. Patshala is a history of school. Schools not only taught uh, them the Vedas, Upanishads, and uh, whatever so, you know, religious texts, they were also taught uh, maths, Ayurveda, which is medicine. So what we use modern terms, you know, science and technology, all of that, grammar, language, all of that was taught in these agraras. So they are the schools of uh, Bangalore. If you can date the oldest agrahara, <laughs> you got the oldest school in Bangalore. So next time around, please don't think on colonial terms and say, which is the oldest school? St. Joseph's, Bishop Cardin's, whatever. Sorry, it's colonial time school. Schools of Bangalore are thousands of years old. We just don't frame our mind in that way. The malls, we are called as santes. We have a sante in Hudi. We have a sante elsewhere. These are the history of malls. People gathered, did their shopping, did their, you know, whatever. All of this is stuff I have not covered. So I'll skip it, but we have uh, things for that. This is the better known, uh, but least understood. Dynasties of Bangalore. The various dynasties that are ruled uh, in uh, Bangalore. Dynasties are essentially royal families, nothing else. Monarchies of the time. So there's the Gangas, Rashtrakutas, Cholas, Hoysalas, Vijayanagar, all of them have ruled in uh, Bang or Bangalore. Okay. Um, and then, how do I know all this story? How do we know all this story? We owe it to this single one man. His name is B.L. Rice, Benjamin Lewis Rice. A white-skinned man, a Bangalorean by birth, a Bangalorean largely by education, a Bangalorean by nativity as well. He lived here most of his life. He was a teacher. Um, what he did was, he was a teacher whose job took him different places. Wherever he went, he found these stones with writing, which is not legible. So slowly he morphed from a teacher to a historian, archaeologist, epigraphist. Documented all of this in the old Mysore region. All of those is about 8,663 or something like that inscription stones in these books called the Epigraphia Carnatica. Okay? <clears throat> and that's what tells us what is in these stones. Unfortunately, he documented it inscription by inscription. So the consolidated understanding of that is not possible for most common laymen. Because you had to collectively read the 100 together and put the story together like I have done. And we owe all our understanding of historic past. Historic is documented in stones or books or whatever about the Bangalore region to this one man. Uh, there's a Rice Memorial Church on Avenue Road. That's um, his father's. So his father was essentially an Englishman, came to India to spread Christianity, etc. So this, um, his son was born here. And um, essentially, he became a Kannadiga, fluent in Kannada, Tamil, and Sanskrit to some extent, obviously English too. Okay. So this is the story of the city, but I didn't want to leave you with only just this. So this is C for C, right? It's not just to hear, forget, and move on. What can you do? I'll show you a lot of these uh, artifacts with, um, you know, um, <laughs> uh, destroyed in a bad state, lying in ditches, ignored all over the place, garbage piles on them, and all of that. What can we do? I'll show you some examples of what you can do with names of people that who help us who are part of the team. It's an informal team. Everyone's part of the team. You join in and you're there. So this is Mohan Naik. He's, a, he's um, essentially a plumber by profession. He scouts the city and discovers these inscriptions in these kind of cities, you know, things, places. We shift them out, put them on pedestals in uh, places like this. Uh, some of you may know this lady. <laughs> this is actually... Um, uh, Shishti School of Design Students. The man here is Nagarajappa, Jakkur resident. He is not English literate, but he is narrating the story of Jakkur via these stones and inscriptions to these students. So he helped us in shifting this, rediscovering, relocating, all of shifting. 
It may sound simple and uh, easy to do. There's a lot of superstition around these stones. They, it's, uh, people will not allow those to be shifted, will not allow it to be touched. So they're, they're okay with it lying in such useless surroundings. They're okay with it being destroyed. They're not okay with it being touched. So it takes a lot of convincing and communication to shift it. You can definitely play a role. Give an example. The Patandur Lake inscription is documented in this inscription stone. Sorry. You know, sitting in a graveyard today, can you believe it? A thousand year old inscription stone, which is a record of building of a lake. Every day I'm, reading, I'm hearing about citizen activists protesting against um, lake pollution, <laughs> you know, uh, encroachment and all of that. A record of building of Patandur Lake, one of the oldest lakes in the city, sitting in a graveyard. These are all graves that you're seeing behind here. And that's the <laughs> cremation uh, sh you know, place where they, there's a shelter for that. How insulting can it be to put something like this? You'll still have lots of work to do. You can help us in you know, shifting these, coordinate, coordinating of this. We do programs all over the city, like the one that I'm doing today. This is in a, this for schools and colleges. Love to do that. You can pick up what we are doing. We'll train you, coach you. You can do it yourself. You would like us to do it somewhere. Please come and help. Invite us. We'll be happy to do it. That's how this has come about. Raj, Raj called us, and you know, we are talking to you today. Students, teaching them about the history, actually helping them decipher those things is an incredible experience. They love it. We can do that. And you can help us do that. A lot of this is unknown, right? Uh, you can help us build wiki pages. Wiki pages today on the history of Bangalore are absolute crap. <laughs> I don't have an issue in using that word. It's been put together by people who don't know the history of Bangalore. It's based on folklore, mythology, and make-believe stuff. We have a lot of good things to tell. We need to put those pages together so that people can read and learn from that. This one's been put together by two people, Vinod Malingam uh, for English and the Kannada page by Vikas Sagade. Takes, um, uh, we'll, we'll give you all the content, we'll help you with that. If you can build it, it'll be great. Photographic documentation. PV, some of you may know him, Venkatesh and Perumal, are excellent photographers, gone around shooting all of them, uh, inscriptions and sculptures and all of that. It's now on uh, Sarpedia, free, copyright free for use, for sure, no, in your uh, books, literature, <laughs> wherever you want. It's another way you can may help create things. We digitally scan inscriptions. I'm sorry. Um, digital scanning, very high-end digital scanning. So this is a stone and this is a digital scan. You can see how nicely the characters are visible. This is a device, very expensive. If you say, I can't do all those things, but I have the money um, and I have the money and I would like to help you with scanning. Very, very expensive uh, thing. I would like to fund you. I'd love to take that money and do the scanning of these. This is digital preservation. And once we build a model, we share it with the world. It's it can be used by anyone for non-commercial purposes, researchers, um, authors, whoever you want it. Two companies, the company who scans it has been doing, uh, doing a, a lot of free work for us and a donor who doesn't want to be named. <laughs> a wonderful man. Uh, he's sponsoring it for us. If you, there's lots to be done. If you want to do that, we'll be happy. Please uh, step up and help us do that. Other skills. There's um, two ladies, Chitra Ramchandran and uh, Vidya Murli. They have fictionalized the story of these inscriptions. <laughs> you know, uh, so this is the story about the Kodigali inscription. Kodigali, you can see there. So they have kind of taken the uh, text of that inscription, built a story around it for children. It's now in, um, you know, it's, it's a serialized fashion in Mayura magazine, both in Kannada and English. There's a blog called Girgit Lake where you can read this. They have done it for about 10 such inscriptions so far. It's become very popular in schools and colleges. Schools, uh, a schools, um, couple of schools actually stepped up. One is doing a dance drama, and the other one is doing uh, uh, something else. Unfortunately, COVID brought it all down. They were preparing for that, and we have to have had those events in April. <laughs> Whenever schools reopen, we'll do those as well. You know, the story of uh, the city, okay? And um, very easy to contact me, uh, contact any one of our team. Uh, do reach out to us, my email address and uh, phone are on that. We are also very active on social media, group Inscription Stones of Bangalore on Facebook and Inscription BLR on Twitter. We share a lot of information there. Uh, that's our um, you know, daily go-to way to share um, you know, information about our project. 
Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, that was the um, presentation I wanted to make. I'm probably way about time. Um, there's any questions and um, there, um, I don't see, um, I don't see any chat questions here. Nevertheless, um, you know, come on to our Facebook page, Twitter or whatever. And um, I think there's some technical issue with chat there. Uh, okay. So um, <laughs> I'm open to questions, pick up the phone, call us, post them on Facebook, post them on Twitter, reach out through the C4C uh, team. Very happy to participate, equip you, educate you. More important than all of that, we want um, Bangaloreans to step up be proud of this kind of incredible heritage. Please help, let's save it. Save it for ourselves, save it for our future generations. Let's not keep going around saying, guess what, Bangalore doesn't have a big story to tell. <laughs> I bet anyone here to tell me an equivalent story for any global capital anywhere in the world. <laughs> you know, there's the older places, there's the Indus Valley, there's all that, yeah, sure. No one's going there by the millions to live there and proudly call it a home. Show me any place in the world, Delhi, Bombay, Hyderabad, Calcutta, Delhi, you know, New York, Tokyo, Beijing, any place you can think of where you can tell the story. You can't. We can here. We are destroying it. We are wasting it away. Let's save it. Okay. Thank you so much. And back to the organizers. <clears throat> Well, this was truly amazing and an eye-opener for most of us. As skeptical as I was, most of us are me. On behalf of Citizens for Citizens, or C4C in short, I thank you all for your time and attending today's talk. I particularly thank Udaya for making sure we understand the history of our city better. Thank you Uday Kumar for a wonderful presentation on this unique platform. And yes, based on the overwhelming response today, C4C will be organizing more such talks and topics that interest all of us very soon. Until then, stay tuned, stay safe and pledge to leave our surroundings a little better than we found it. Thank you. Um, okay, I believe there are chat questions. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see them here. Uh, but what I will do is I'll wait for them and um, uh, I'm, I'm having those shared. I will answer those one by one. Um, so it's an open-ended talk for me. Um, those of you who want to hang on and hear to those questions, please stay as long as you want. Yeah, um, Sorry for the um, delay. I'm trying to get those questions on another medium. Okay. Um, so, um, how are they transporting the? Um, materials. I'm presuming this is uh, to do with um, the menace and the dolmens and all of that. Um, well, obviously, uh, there were two things. One is they were not transporting it uh, enormous distances. Because if you saw the um, Mangondan early um, location, it was on a hillock. It was essentially, a, there was lots of stone there. So they were um, extracting the stone from right from there and directing it over there. Um, so they would have used um, you know, the, uh, today we have become used to um, machinery. <laughs> you know, everything for us is um, hydraulic uh, excavator, you know, JCB or something like that. Not necessary that we need um, enormous, um, complicated machinery. They also had time on their hands. 
so they had the ability to, um, um, <clears throat> you know, they had time on their hands. They also had manpower. They also used animal power. Um, so they would build ramps and they would build pits and they're not digging into that and all of that. Uh, quite doable, not as hard as it seems. Uh, transporting, so that I would say they were really at the place. So transportation was not a big deal. Erection was, and for erection they would have used um, animals as well as you know human power for that. Um, did we have enough water to culti cultivate sugarcane in Domlur? Absolutely. Um, so like I said, there was the uh, Domlur tank. There were two tanks in Domlur, by the way. There were actually quite a few tanks there. Um, so there was the Binamangla tank, there was the Domlur tank, then there was the uh, uh, Sinivagilu tank. Those tanks are bounding all over the place. The Binamangla tank is still there. The um, ST tank is still there in a marshy uh, location there. So they uh, essentially had, uh, cons they constructed um, two booths. Two booths are essentially water outlets. Uh, 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 you know, where there was a, a lever kind of thing which were used to raise and uh, lower the, uh, an, uh, an obstruction and l control the flow of water out from tanks. Yes, flood irrigation was very possible. Fact that, you know, they were growing paddy, see, nel, wagilu, and sugarcane essentially is that. It's been around for, wetland cultivation has been around for a very long time. In Bangalore, obviously, there's no problems at all. Rains a lot and there were tanks um, constructed a long time back. Um, instruction referring to sugarcane around Dakshina Pinakini, no, that instruction, the inscription is uh, right there in uh, Domlur, or sugarcane fields. Yeah. Um, how do we execute further the uh, people of Bangalore? Absolutely critical. Uh, every one of you who has um, heard this talk, this is going to be shared on YouTube as well for your later view, uh, viewing. Um, please spread the word. Uh, please study this. Please visit these places. Uh, right now, because of COVID and lockdown, we have, um, uh, you know, we're not having these field events. Uh, Domlur, for example, you know, showing you the story of Domlur at the Domlur Chakna, Chakna Swami Temple is a half-day affair uh, in, a, in a superficial way. It takes days for, for us to explain all of that. We do those events. Please um, join us for those. Spread, uh, uh, if you like to do th things like story writing, photography, dance, choreography, whatever. There's material out there. Let's leverage it and let's spread the word. And um, another very important thing. Um, now that you know the story, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of um, folklore, mythology, uh, folk tales that's attributed to Bangalore. Every one of the things that I spoke about today is fact-based, evidence-based, either in the form of writing, pottery, buildings or something of that type. It's not legends, no stories. So next time you hear a story, challenge it. What's the proof? What's the evidence? No, my mother told me. Yeah, my mother told me a million things too. That's okay. Let's, let's get back to the facts and let's be proud of what we have based on factual evidences. Kadamaleshwara temple, how old is it? Yeah, the, <laughs> I didn't talk about it. There's an inscription right beside the temple that's from 1669. Uh, which refers to the temple as the um, Mallikarjuna temple of Mallapura. Malleshwaram's erstwhile name was Mallapura. Or like uh, common belief, Malleshwaram was not uh, formed in um, 1895 or 1900 or whatever. So there's a village called Mallapura that existed there from at least 1669. And uh, that inscription refers to the temple, not as the Kada Malleshwara, it's the Mallikarjuna temple. So that temple's at least that old. Again, uh, you know, that's, there's no evidence, there's no documentation to say how old that temple is. That's the earliest record. So we'll have to say 1669 is when we know it to be around from. Um, lots of stories, especially, you know, Shivaji built it, somebody else built it and all that. None of that is fact-based. Uh, I'd be happy to say, I don't know. <laughs> Let's just say, we know the temple's been around from 1669. There's an inscription next door. Go read it. It's an almost uh, readable Canada. Anybody can read it. Uh, are there inscriptions in and around river basins of Bangalore? Dakshina Pinakni, Kadgodi, yeah. The uh, Patandur inscription that I showed you uh, is in the graveyard, which is actually on the Dakshina Pinakini river bed. <laughs> uh, 
no, re no reason, you know, Bangalore really has streams all over the place. And many of these streams, I think, uh, if you go back a few hundred years, would have been perennial streams. Uh, even in my younger days, uh, you know, the hillock here is, is gone, had a perennial stream, believe it or not. We would have about a foot um, wide water flowing down, which slowly goes down towards today Nandini layout and whatever, and reaches the Arkavati. So perennial streams were abounding all over the place. Um, pretty easy to build a lake and build a settlement. They didn't have to go live right by the river, not required. Um, Nandi Tirtha temple at the Temple Street. Yeah, again, this is post 16th century. In fact, this is very recent, less than 100 years old. Um, that's actually a, not a Tirtha or a spring. Uh, this actually undergoed pipeline from um, Sankey Tank into that place uh, that had clogged up. So in the 80s, when they were cleaning up that place, the unclogged the pipe and water stored, started, you know, started to flow back again. Um, okay. That was that, and um, that's all I have um, here. That's all I have in terms of questions here. However, this chat window is. Um, uh, for the uh, YouTube link will remain open. If there's still any unanswered there, I will answer them in person there, or you can always con contact me. And um, with that, I think uh, we'll finish the program. Thank you so much. Uh, last question about Alsur and Sankey. Um, baby infants, uh, really, Harish. Uh, Sankey and Alsur were built during British times, less than 100, 120 years old. Uh, the Alsur uh, Sankey tank was built, if I'm right, around, I forget the date, around 1865 or, some, or something like that. Um, very, very recent lakes. So this is what I, the point I want to make again and again. Uh, we are so used to these uh, popular names. We don't know Jakur, we don't care about Hebbal, we don't care about Behandur, we don't care about Patandur, we don't care about you know, all these lakes which are thousands of years old. We are obsessed with Alsur Sankey, Dharmambudi Sampangi. Forget these. They gone and uh, they they they're okay. They're small. There's really other things to be proud of. Okay, and I'll uh, stop here. And um, I hope you all had a good time and you learned a lot. So, uh, well, learning is like I said earlier. Learning is the um, good thing. La helping last, helping that story last is even more important. It's there for us to touch and feel. No other city has this opportunity. Let's not waste it away. Let's save it, let's cherish it, and let's celebrate it. Thank you so much. Bye.